at this time, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Erica Salter. Dr. Erica Salter is an Associate Professor of Healthcare Ethics and Pediatrics at St. Louis University Center for Healthcare Ethics and Department of Pediatrics. She directs the PhD programs in healthcare ethics and serves as the Vice Chair of the Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital Ethics Committee. She is the co-author of the recent publication, Mapping the Moral Terrain of Clinical, De Clinical Deception in the Hastings Center Report. Welcome, Dr. Salter. Okay, thank you so much, Olivia, for that lovely introduction. It's so nice to be with you. I was just saying um, how close St. Louis and Louisville are. I just drove four hours to get here, and here I am. Guys. Uh, so thank you for having me. I am here to talk to you about a um, real fun topic in ethics. We're talking about lying today. So we're going to talk about deception and whether it has a place in clinical practice, and if so, how we might make better de uh, decisions about deception in clinical practice. So I'll just sort of start by mentioning, you know, one of the very first moral lessons we learn as children, I think, is do not lie. It's a maxim that's repeated probably by our parents quite a bit and by the adults around us that are interested in our moral formation. Um, and, you know, we think that deception is really um, not a good practice because it undermines something that is foundational to human relationships and community. And that is the ability to rely on the truthfulness of one another's statements to each other. That really is part of the fabric of our ability to relate to one another and be in community. So that's, I think, a very good starting point for kids. Don't lie. Um, however, it's also pretty common knowledge, and I think research supports this, uh, that despite this maxim, uh, most of us do engage in pretty regular deceptive practices um, in our lives. So um, these conversations or these practices might be called white lies, and we can think of I think, numerous examples. So I was just on the telephone with my grandmother the other day, who was sometimes difficult to get off the telephone. So I said, oh, man, I'm so sorry. My, my battery's running a little bit low. Maybe that was not a good choice for me to make. Maybe that was not a justified eth uh, ethical deception, but that was a deceptive practice that I engaged in. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, some of these white lies, we might even call pro-social lies. So what that means is, in fact, they're not necessarily undermining relationship and community, but there are some lies like the lie to your spouse that they look amazing in the outfit that they're wearing or you know, think of then think of many communications that we have with the one with the ones that we love um, in order to um, make them feel better. Uh, those might be called pro-social lies, insofar as they actually sort of uh, help us form better bonds and relationships. In fact, in a few weeks, a lot of parents all over the country will be engaging in a pretty widespread but adorable um, act of deception when they uh, fill Easter baskets. Oh no, this is sorry, my big reveal. <laughs> there we go. Oh, there you go. When we fill, fill Easter baskets and hide Easter eggs and tell our kids that the, the Easter bunny did it, right? <laughs> um, all right. So we do, it seems, um, probably hold the idea of not lying fairly seriously and closely, but also we do engage in deceptive practices pretty regularly. That seems to be true just in, in regular social relationships. But what about clinical practice? You know, this this seems to be one area where it's it should just be true all the time. You don't lie. Never lie. And that is actually the advice that a lot of ethicists would give. That's a lot of advice, uh, the advice that ethics textbooks would give. That's sort of the first response that we'd want to give a clinical practitioner um, contemplating a deceptive act in medicine. Well, you should just never lie in clinical practice. Um, well, when you look at real cases and when you actually start looking a little closer at how we practice clinical medicine, that actually, um, we don't hold to that. We actually do deceive, uh, maybe not regularly, but not irregularly. Like we, we do it fairly, you know, commonly in, in our day-to-day uh, -day practice with patients. So the question was for my co-author and I up on the screen is um, Dr. Abram Brummett. Brummett. Um, he and I wrote this paper together that Olivia mentioned and that today's talk will be based on. Um, when, if ever, is it justifiable to deceive in clinical practice? And importantly for us, what are the features of the act of deception that make a moral difference? So how can we evaluate a deceptive act as being either justifiable, meaning we have good reasons to do it, or unjustifiable? Because we thought, you know, the simple maxim, don't lie, actually was not really providing a lot of thoughtful and sensitive practitioners the proper guidance in scenarios, because sometimes we really do have good reasons that we're trying to balance with the maxim, do not lie. So 
this is my presentation outline today. Um, I will try to keep it brief enough that we have some time for Q&A at the end of my talk, and then we will get to hear from four other speakers on various topics related to deception. Um, so I promise to stay within my time so we have enough time for all of that wonderful conversation. Um, and we're gonna start with a case. So really our entry into this topic of deception, my co-author and I, was a real case that was presented to um, our clinical ethics committee. And, um, and it really had us thinking. It was a case that he and I actually disagreed on for a while. We, had, we brought in other thinkers. There was a lot of good conversation. And I'll read that case to you um, now. So a patient experiences a miscarriage at 11 weeks in the hospital. The hospital has a program for low-income patients that provides burial of fetal remains in a small graveyard where the names are engraved on a memorial plaque above the site. This patient qualifies for the program and she gratefully agrees to participate. However, a staff member accidentally incinerates the fetal remains during routine disposure of other bio tissue. The error is not discovered until after the ashes are discarded. The physicians involved in this patient's care consult the ethics committee asking, we have nothing left to bury. Can we just put the name on the plaque and not burden this patient with the information with information that will only worsen her grief? So how should we advise this clinician? You know, clearly they were sort of taking stock of some important considerations in a case like this. It's a grieving mother. How should we respond to this terrible tragedy? It was a, it's an accident, but it's obviously a terrible accident in a way that doesn't worsen her grief. Or should we just tell her the truth? Um, so we thought it was a probably more complicated question than just, well, you have to tell her the truth. And we started sort of asking, well, what are the features of a case like this that would make it, you know, more or less justifiable to deceive? So we started assembling a collection of real life cases that involve clinicians considering acts of deception. And then we discussed aspects of those cases that we thought made a difference, morally speaking. Um, again, as we researched, it became clear to us that the common maxim, never deceive, just was not satisfactory. So we really wanted to ask what features uh, an ethically sensitive clinician should pay attention to in these sorts of um, contemplations. We uh, essentially produced a framework that we hope will help guide um, clinicians and ethicists in uh, answering questions about deception. And I'll get to that framework eventually, but I'm actually going to primarily use cases today to kind of explore these issues with you. And we'll get to the framework at the end. Okay, so first, let's start with a few definitions and some background. Um, we define deception in this paper. We uh, adopt Cicela Box definition, which is you know one among many. There are other definitions you could use, but we adopt the uh, definition that deception is an act of omission or withholding or commission, lying, that aims to induce or maintain a false belief in a target. We This is a, a broader definition in terms of the options available to you, um, philosophically speaking, and we thought it was wise to um, adopt a broader definition that includes both active lying as well as misrepresentations or non-disclosure or withholding, um, because some of the most troubling ethical, ethical dilemmas, I think, are acts of misrepresentation or withholding, and we thought that, that those deserve consideration alongside the acts of commission and lying. So while there's a strong prima facie duty to veracity, that means you know all things being equal, we should be telling the truth. Um, there's actually some acknowledgement in professional society statements and legal rulings, and even some uh, fellow bioethicists have uh, written on this topic, acknowledging that there may be some cases in clinical practice where deception is ethically justified. Uh, typically, this arises as a, as a concern of what's known as therapeutic privilege. Perhaps you've heard this term used. Uh, this uh, term refers to the ability of a healthcare provider to withhold otherwise important information from a patient when there's a justified belief that the disclosure would cause that patient some sort of considerable harm. I do want to note here that with the concept of therapeutic privilege, there's the burden of proof is on the clinician in proving that the harm is significant enough um, to deceive. Um, and this actually comes out of a landmark legal ruling known as Canterbury ver uh, versus Spence. This was a uh, federal appeals case that actually established the doctrine of informed consent as a bedrock um, principle and practice in uh, clinical medicine. But as a part of that decision, they did actually address situations where disclosure might be harmful either physically or psychologically to patients, saying that those might be exceptions to the doctrine of informed consent. Um, there's also some statements in, um, for example, the American College of Physicians Ethics Manual about um, when you might deceive or consider deceiving patients. Uh, and then there's also um, a couple of flow charts developed by ethicists that attempt to address this issue. And I'll, I just want to sort of note that 
in these flowcharts, really what they're trying to do is give you kind of a simple mechanism by which to decide, should I or should I not deceive in this case? So they are doing some of the work that we're attempting to do as well, which is what are the right questions to be asking? And then depending on your answers to those questions, it will sort of lead you in various directions. Well, I will not um, review much of the work of, this is um, Richard et al. and then Daniel Sokol's uh, flowcharts up here. Um, I would point you to these references if you're interested in reading more on this topic. There's some interesting uh, work being done by others. Finally, um, well, our paper and this presentation, I think, will fo focus primarily on how to understand and evaluate potential acts of deception. We do want to be very clear and assert right up front that in most cases, the very best approach here is a preventive approach. For example, we should talk to patients ahead of time about their disclosure preferences. If there's a possibility that we might be tempted to deceive about something, we want to talk to patients upfront about what they may or may not want. Uh, Benjamin Friedman's work on offering truth is another example of, of this sort of sensitive and kind of relationally uh, dynamic way of being careful about not offering too much, not giving unwanted information, but sort of seeing using invitations to see what is wanted by the patient or the family member. So prevention is what we should aim for. However, even with good preventive work, clinicians may still find themselves in situations where deception is contemplated and perhaps even justifiable. So if you think back to the case that we just read, that we have nothing left to bury case, there's really no way to anticipate this happening. This was a kind of strange, fluke, accidental, and tragic uh, thing that happened. And here we are, sort of that's, that's the reality that we're presented with. What should we do now with the decision? <clears throat> Okie dokie. So we're going to move on briefly to justification. Um, and I want to talk about justification as being in two primary categories for deception. And really the work that we do in this framework around deception is all around the question, how hard would it be to justify this deception? Because again, remember our prima facie duty is to truth telling, which means we need to make a strong case when we were considering deception. The question here is how strong of a case do we need to make, right? So let's talk about justification. Um, by justification, I just mean what are the reasons? What are the good ethical reasons that we might uh, consider an act of deception? We distill justification into um, two basic categories, autonomy-based justifications and beneficence justifications. And I'll start here on this slide by reviewing the autonomy-based justifications. The idea here is that um, these justifications are grounded in the potential for a deceptive act to respect, protect, or restore a patient's autonomy. I'll give you a couple examples in the next slide just uh, so you can sort of see what we're talking about. And the strength of this justification increases or gets stronger as the likelihood of these things happening increases. So the more likely we are to restore a patient's autonomy or protect a patient's autonomy or respect a patient's autonomy, the justification becomes stronger. Our reasons become better. Okay, so a couple of examples here. So these two cases are both from a very popular clinical ethics textbook by Bernard Lowe called Resolving Ethical Dilemmas. Um, in fact, this is used uh, widely in medical schools and um, nursing schools. This might be a text that you're familiar with. The first case is the It's Just Juice case. So imagine there's a patient experiencing severe mental health sy symptoms and is refusing to take their psychiatric medication. The clinical team, and we know the psychiatric med medication might actually help restore some decision-making capacity, right? The clinical team might suggest that the medication be administered uh, covertly within a juice box, let's say, and we would tell the patient it's just juice. The idea behind this sort of deceptive act is that it might be justified according to an autonomy-based justification. Because we're able to restore the patient's autonomy with this act, potentially that's why we would do it. I'm not saying that's necessarily right or wrong. I'm just sort of showing the reasons why we might uh, contemplate this uh, particular act. In the second case, imagine a patient who has explicitly expressed their wish not to be told bad news. They say, listen, I can't handle it. I don't handle it well, just don't tell me. Uh, now, certainly this type of request would probably call for some additional conversation. We'd wanna ask some follow-up questions. We'd wanna explore that request. But we can, at the end of the day, if they sort of are, are um, uh, rigid in that request and uh, that's what they end up wanting and they communicate that with you, I think it's very clear that an act of deception in that case would be justified in, in an autonomy-based way. We're respecting their wish, their autonomous wish not to be told by withholding information from them. 
All right, the second category of justifications are those grounded in beneficence. So here we mean doing good, and I might also include some non-maleficence here, so avoiding harm. So beneficence-based justifications are grounded in the potential for a de deceptive act to do significant good or avoid significant harm, either psychological or um, physical. A beneficence-based justification gets stronger as the likelihood and magnitude of good provided or harm avoided increases. All right, some more examples here. Imagine the mother of a young patient approaches a clinician after the traumatic death of that patient and asks, um, doctor, did my daughter suffer when she was dying? And you strongly suspect that people actually were, and it, it was very distressing for everyone. And you're actually quite worried about disclosing this to the mom. You think that there might be good reason for withholding that information from a mom who is grieving. Um, that would be a beneficence-based justification. You'd be invoking uh, considerations of beneficence for not telling the mom that actually we think perhaps she did suffer in her in her final moments. A second case, um, let's say an upset dementia patient is um, repeatedly requesting to speak to their mother, but the medical team um, and the medical team thinks it would help calm her down if she was able to speak to her mom. But they also know that Actually, her mom has passed away. Her mom is no longer with us. So this is a real case. This is a very interesting case. So they actually propose that the patient's sister calls her and pretends to be mom. And this will, you know, hopefully leave a significant psychological and perhaps physical good for this patient. But it's clearly an act of deception, right? Um, okay. I will not actually, I don't have time to talk to you about this right now. But if you're interested, find me after. There's some um, uh, fascinating uh, work being done in dementia um, construction spaces around ways that deception is kind of in built into the environment. So ways that we're sort of deceiving dementia patients to help keep them within the confines of facilities or campuses, um, but in very sort of clever and interesting ways um, that help keep them calm. Okay, so now we're going to look at two additional cases. And as I walk through these cases with you, I'd like you to think, think about your own response. I'm going to read the case, think about, you know, what would I advise this clinician? What maybe would I do if I were the clinician in this scenario? Then I'm going to invite you to think of a couple additional questions and variations to the case. And I'm going to ask you to, again, consider what, how might these variations change the complexion of your assessment, right? Do any of these matter ethically or are they sort of, you know, irrelevant to uh, our determination? So we're going to start with a case called Please Don't Tell My Wife. Mr. K is admitted to the oncology ward for treatment of gastrointestinal cancer that has caused significant internal bleeding. Dr. Friedrich, the attending oncologist, discusses the possibility of a blood transfusion with Mr. K and his wife, Mrs. P. Mrs. P explains that they would not want a blood transfusion for her husband, even if his life was in danger. They're both Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, Dr. Friedrich counsels the couple on the life-saving nature of a blood transfusion, but they continue to refuse. And Dr. Friedrich places a note in the patient's chart that he's not to receive blood products. Later that evening, after his wife has gone home, Mr. K calls a nurse into his room. He explains he has actually had a blood transfusion uh, in the past without his wife knowing, and he would want another one if his life were in danger. He stresses that his wife cannot know about this transfusion if it were to happen because it would have dire social consequences for him um, and his wife and the religious community if, if uh, they were to find out. He says, it would be bad if I died, but worse if I lived and my wife found out about the transfusion. All right. So that night, Mr. K's hemoglobin drops to critical levels. Dr. Friedrich orders a blood transfusion. This is actually not the decision that we're going to analyze today. We have a capacitated consenting patient. I think most, most of us would say, okay, we give the blood transfusion, right? But Dr. Um, Friedrich then gathers the medical team afterwards and explains that they must remove all evidence of the transfusion from the room and be especially careful not to discuss the transfusion with the patient's wife. All right, just think about, is that a justifiable act? Is that, is that even an act of deception to begin with? And if it is, how might it be justified? So consider that. And let's ask these further questions. So we already asked the first two questions. So here are a couple variations. Let's say Mrs. P directly asks Dr. Friedrich the next day, did my husband, so she suspects something, did my husband receive a blood transfusion? Does that change the case? Odds, yeah, okay. What if Mrs. P can't come to the hospital and instead is receiving only phone updates on a daily basis? Does that change 
how you understand this case. So she's not coming, we're not changing the room in, at all. We're just sort of controlling what we say to her on the phone. And then finally, what about um, a situation where the patient, Mr. F, assures the doctor he will eventually tell his wife about the transfusion. He just needs some time to figure out how to do this. All right, so it's not a permanent decept act of deception. It's sort of a temporary one. <laughs> Don't worry, we will discuss all these features in a moment. I'm sort of priming you to think about what, what, what might be ethically salient here. We're going to move on to another case. I find these, I, these cases to me are just fascinating. And there are so many of them when you start looking. Um, and I think it's really helpful to kind of work through actual clinical, cl in clinical cases where deception might actually be justified to really decide like what, what is good advice that we can offer in these situations. All right, another case, wedding worries. On a Friday morning, Dr. Jung, a gynecologic oncologist, reviews the most recent scans and lab tests of her patient, Cynthia, who was diagnosed with stage three epithelial ovarian cancer three years ago. After initial surgical, radiological, and chemotherapeutic treatment, she's been in remission. Unfortunately, the imaging and lab values um, indicate that the cancer has returned, and this will likely require Cynthia to undergo additional radiation and chemotherapy. Dr. Jung recalls from her last phone call with Cynthia that this weekend, her daughter is getting married an event that is eagerly anticipated and celebrated by the whole family. Dr. Jung would typically call a patient right away after receiving these sorts of test results to discuss their implications and talk about next steps. But this time, contemplates waiting until Monday to share the bad news, hoping that this brief deception will protect Cynthia's weekend celebrations from the fear and uncertainty of the bad news. All right, so what should Dr. Jung do? Um, what what kind of act is this? Is this a deceptive act withholding some important information for a temporary amount of time, right? Is that a justified um, act of deception? And what about these variations? What if the test results are actually inconclusive and require further investigation to confidently diagnose a recurrence? So we're not confident that the cancer has come back. We need to do more work. Does that change how you understand this case? And what about this variation? So instead, the patient and her husband have come in for a clinic visit. Um, they're together. And while the husband is in the bathroom, Cynthia, anticipating bad news, she kind of sees what's, what might be coming. She tells Dr. Y, hey, our daughter's wedding is tomorrow. And my husband just really cannot handle bad news right now. Can you just avoid the topic of the test results altogether? Let's wait until next week to talk about this. So the patient is requesting a deception on behalf of her husband, right? The good that she sees it might do for her husband. Okay, so those are the cases that I want to sort of keep in our minds as we talk through this framework. And I'll actually return to some of these variations to show you how the framework might be applied. Um, I try to do a lot of the, the sort of case examples because I'm going to show you this slide a lot and it can get a little dry. <laughs> it's um, a black and white uh, diagram. So I can't make it any more fun than that. I'll put some stars on there for you, but <laughs> we're going to spend a little bit of time here and I do apologize for that. But I kind of want to, I wanted to show you the ways in which um, these features are already a part of these cases. And then this might be a way to kind of call them out in a framework that would allow us to think more systematically through them. So I just very briefly want to talk about the goals of this framework that my co-author, um, Dr. Brumman and I produced. The goal is not to answer the question, should I or should I not deceive? Unlike the flow charts that we looked at earlier, it's not going to sort of algor algorithmize you to a yes or no answer. Instead, really what we're asking is, what are some salient features? What are some important questions to be asking? And how might that affect the strength of justification required? So what I mean by that is, how good do our reasons have to be in order for this uh, act of deception to be morally justified? Again, what this will require, I mean, perhaps um, this might be good news for you, this might be bad news for you. At the end of this framework, because we're not saying yes or no, it still requires some um, ethically sensitive, thoughtful reasoning and discussion to really decide, is this a justified act of deception? But the hope here is that a framework like this will help you see more clearly the features or the questions that should be asked in order to make that sort of determination. Okie dokie. So the first question our framework asks is, who is the target of deception? Our framework flags the target of dece deception as an ethically salient feature of these cases and identifies, we identify four common targets of a deceptive act, ordered from the party with the strongest claim to the truth all the way on the right, 
um, to the party with the weakest claim to the truth on the left. So starting uh, from the strongest, it's a capacitated patient, then an authorized surrogate, then an incapacitated but conscious patient, and then a non-surrogate family member. So according to this framework, deceiving a capacitated patient requires stronger justification or better reasons than deceiving an authorized surrogate decision maker, and then which uh, and deceiving an authorized surrogate decision maker requires stronger justification than deceiving an incapacitated but conscious patient, and so forth. So if we look at um, the wedding worries variation that I just uh, talked to you about, where we're first we're contemplating deceiving the patient. So that's the star over on the right. When we change it to we're contemplating deceiving a non-surrogate family member, the husband, we move from the, the right to the left. So the strength of justification decreases. All right, the second question our framework asks is what is the nature of the information? So um, the nature of the information being withheld or lied about can vary according to a number of features or dimensions. And we pull out three specific dimensions, epistemic confidence, relevance to a medical decision, and relevance to the target. This dimension of the framework recognizes that um, the strength of justification required for an act of deception depends at least in part on the actual information being deceived about or withheld. So we'll start um, with epistemic confidence or how confident are we in the truth of the information being withheld or deceived about? The more confident you are about the truth of the information, the stronger the justificatory requirement. Um, so again, we think about the wedding worries case, that first variation where we move from, we're very certain that this cancer has recurred to actually we're, we suspect that it has, but we need some more follow-up. That would move um, you sort of from stronger justification to weaker justification on this uh, framework. Um, the information uh, in this framework is also being differentiated based on whether or not it pertains to a medical decision. So acts of deception involving information related to medical decision-making require stronger justification than acts that are unrelated to a, to a medical decision. And by related to a medical decision, we really are looking at the types of information that are required by informed consent, right? So um, diagnosis, nature, nature of the diagnosis, risks, benefits um, of the proposed interventions, alternative in, uh, interventions, things like that, consequences of treatment. So deception about interventions, or excuse me, deception about in information related to a medical decision is harder to, to justify because of the nature of shared decision-making and of course the priority we give to disclosure based on the doctrine of informed consent. Finally, acts are further distinguished based on the preferences of the targets. So this is an interesting one. If we know this target to um, consider this information to be very important to them, that requires stronger justification. <laughs> if we know that this target actually considers this information to be fairly insignificant, that requires less justification. I do wanna sort of highlight here, when you don't know, you may not know, like is this information that's really important to them or not, not important to them at all, you should probably presume, especially if it's related to a medical decision, that it is um, important to them. So you'd sort of start with the assumption that we're starting on the right. Okie dokie. <clears throat> Moving on to the nature of the act. All right, this is where we get into those first two categories, which is lying deception and non-lying deception. Again, this sort of commission versus omission question. Um, we describe uh, three axes along which acts of non-lying de de deception can vary with respect to the strength of justification. And what we do here is we sort of incorporate the common intuition that acts of lying deception or deliberate statements to a speaker, or excuse me, by a speaker that a speaker knows to be false with the intention of misleading or misrepresenting that information to a target, um, that requires a stronger justification. Um, that that uh, acts of lying deception require stronger justification than acts of non-lying deception. So that's that first category up there. Now let's look a little closer at um, the ways in which acts of non-lying deception might vary. So we have three axes here, a chronological axis, a content axis, and a leading axis. I'll talk through each of these. Um, it's not necessarily, I think, obvious what these might mean. So the chronolo chronological axis reflects the duration of the withholding act. So it may involve only a temporary withholding. So remember the wedding worries um, scenario where uh, we're actually just contemplating withholding this diagnostic information for a weekend, not indefinitely. Um, or we might contemplate in some of these other cases, we're actually thinking like the, um, we have nothing left to bury case. We think that this, we would always uh, deceive this patient. We would, we would never tell her the truth about um, what happened to the fetal remains. 
withholding acts um, uh, of greater duration generally we think require stronger justification uh, than acts of shorter duration. Um, and we can look at, oh, no, not up on the board, sorry. We'll keep going. The content access to so the next access here is um, reflects how much of the truth will be withheld. So clinicians may choose to withhold the whole truth or only part of the truth. And I'll give you an example of this. We haven't actually talked through this example. It's an interesting one. Um, consider the case of a patient who needs a kidney transplant and a family member has volunteered to be a donor um, or to you know, see if they're a donor match in front of the patient. And let's say later, the potential donor who's actually a medical match for this patient comes forward to their advocate. And says, I said I would donate, but actually I'm really uncomfortable donating. I do not wanna donate. I, I love my brother, my cousin, but I don't wanna be uh, a donor for him. Um, we might think about clinicians telling the recipient in this case, oh, your brother was not a suitable donor. So in a way, that's sort of a half truth, right? He's not a suitable donor because he didn't want to donate. But we kind of are insinuating that he wasn't a good medical match for the donation. So that would be a case where we're sort of withholding like a half truth. Okay. The third axis here is leading. This is a really interesting feature that we didn't see discussed really anywhere in the literature. And the idea here is that um, leading always accompanies acts of withholding information um, and describes the way clinicians behave or communicate either verbally or non-verbally to guide the target into a false belief without directly lying. So you might think of the um, sort of systematic cleanup that the medical team did after the transfusion, right? So we're gonna remove all evidence, things we wouldn't normally consider doing, we're removing it all because we, wanna, we don't want any evidence that this transfusion has happened. Or um, another commonly contemplated form of deception that you would say um, includes some pretty uh, deliberate acts of leading is what's known as a slow code or a show code. Uh, if you've heard of these um, attempts at um, demonstrating to family that we are doing um, a resuscitation attempt in sort of full effort, but in fact, we, we aren't. So we're leading them with sort of our physical acts, but we are not engaging sort of in a full force sure. effort at resuscitation of the patient because we don't think it will benefit the patient. Okay, very briefly, um, I wanna talk about um, a category that we do not define as a deceptive act. It's something that you might contemplate in this category of you know, acts of deception, but we think it actually takes you off the framework. And those are acts of deflection. So an example of this would be, let's say the wife says, did my husband have a transfusion? You could actually not be deceptive and say, I can't answer that question. I mean, they will take from that what they will take from that, but that wouldn't, we think, be a, um, an act of deception. We think that that actually takes you into other territory. You're neither confirming nor denying, and it doesn't lead them to a false belief, and you're not intending that they would um, maintain a false belief. So that would take you sort of off the framework, but again, another sort of uh, option to consider in these cases is could I actually not deceive at all and instead deflect? So I can't answer that question, or you should ask your husband about that, things like that. All right. So finally, we're gonna look at the fourth question of the framework. This is the last slide with this framework on it. Um, the fourth, fourth question of the framework asks, what is the context of the act? This category examines um, uh, the context specifically with regard to two aspects. And my um, instinct here is there probably are actually additional axes or dimensions that we could add to this. These are the two that my co-author and I thought of, but if you can think of other ones, I would be um, really interested to hear your thoughts. So the two that we came up with were level of coordination required and the visibility of the act. So first, acts of deception uh, vary with regard to how many people must be involved or how many people are implicated in order to carry out the deception. Um, acts involving more people require high coordination and thus require a stronger ethical justification. Um, some acts, for example, if an oncologist decides to withhold a stage four cancer diagnosis from a hospitalized capacitated patient, would require many additional staff, nurses, imaging, lab techs, physicians and consulting services, social workers, many beyond that primary oncologist to withhold or deflect information. Thus, this would be a very high level of coordination required by an act like this, requiring much stronger justification. And second here, we'll look at visibility. So some acts may be quite private, while others may be widely visible. Acts of coordination 
imply, um, excuse me, acts of high coordination imply high visibility. So if you have to involve a lot of people, then it's obviously very visible. Um, but uh, you don't have to be highly coordinated in, in order to be highly visible. And I'll give you an example of this. Consider um, a, a single actor deceiving um, a patient. So only one person involved, it was not highly coordinated. <laughs> However, they decided to bring this to the ethics committee for retrospective case review by the whole committee. So now a whole committee is sort of observing and discussing a case like this. And that means it's higher visibility, thus requiring stronger justification. The um, idea behind this particular axis, and I won't get into many details here, but it actually comes from the Catholic Church's idea of scandal. And the idea here is that, you know, we should not um, mislead other people into wrongdoing by publicizing acts that may be sort of morally questionable. So we, you know, we could talk about um, what that might mean or not mean in these cases. Okay, so that's the framework. And again, I want to return to the goal of this framework. It is not, and I'll um, just put the whole framework on the board for you. The idea here is not that we would replace professional judgment or expert judgment of clinicians um, and tell you one way or the other whether you should um, deceive a patient. Um, in fact, I think that flowcharts really shouldn't be making these sorts of decisions, that these decisions require a level of nuance and ethical complexity and sensitivity that really human people are best positioned to do in sort of a dynamic and coordinated way with, um, you know, potentially with the people around them as uh, discussion partners. So instead, a framework like ours um, reminds us of some of the important features of these acts, things that we should keep on our minds, questions we should be asking, and um, might help guide that discussion. But again, at the end of the day, an ethically sensitive clinician um, would need to do some reflecting and thinking and come to their own um, choice about uh, a case like this. All right. So as these cases demonstrate, I think, you know, there are many clinical scenarios where the terrain is not clear and smooth. Like it's actually quite rocky. We do not know how best to navigate it. There are certain boulders in our way. We don't know, do we go over that boulder? Do we go around that boulder? Are there ways through, through this rocky terrain that help us, that allow us to fulfill our ethical obligations to patients and families? And we think that, you know, many clinicians, especially clinicians that have encountered cases like the ones I've discussed today, um, have found the categorical rejection of deception to be a poorly suited advice um, to give to clinicians in these uh, scenarios because they don't really it doesn't really respond to the complexities of medical care. So simply put, there are uh, just cases where a clinician might consider deception as a permissible way forward, and we want to help them make sense of that um, intuition or thought. Um, so the aim of our framework here is to better capture the broad dimensions um, and broad uh, range of cases where deception might arise and then equip clinicians with the right kind of tools for assessing those um, situations. Because again, as we've seen in these cases, there can be some very compelling reasons to consider deception. There, there might be some, you know, real good that we could do or sort of autonomy restoring or respecting um, that we could accomplish with some deception. So when should we when should we deceive and when should we not deceive? So um, that is the end. So we have about I think eight minutes left in my time of the talk where we can maybe do a little bit of Q and A and then we will hand it off to um, four of our excellent speakers to explore additional contexts where deception might be a, a topic. What questions do we have? Yes. I think, you know, we live in such a time where there's so much bias and unconscious bias. Uh, do you think Blacks and maybe Hispanics experience more lying in healthcare? Just your 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 experience, what would be your opinion on that? Yeah, that's um, an important question to ask. And, you know, the um, topic of bias, um, in prejudice in uh, aspects of deception. We don't really explore in this framework, but I absolutely think they can influence our intuitions about cases of deception, right? So we're not really interrogating the reasons why we might say, well, we should just lie to this patient. Let's just make it easier and lie to this patient. I think it's a plausible hypothesis that those groups might be um, lied to more frequently. I think we should definitely question whether that is a justified act. Like why, why, why would we consider that to be a more justifiable way forward with certain groups of patients? And I think the importance of building trust in certain communities, I think would also lead us to maybe say, 
gosh, we would need a really, really, really good reason um, to deceive, um, especially with patients where maybe we need to do a lot more work with trust building. Yeah, thank you. Yes. So where we reflect in not answering the question where the um, wife asks and my husband get a blood transfusion, mm -hmm. I put it on the husband, like he mm -hmm. has are we now doing harm to the husband where the husband has access to protect his privacy? I mean, absolutely. I mean, and this is part of the complexity of these sorts of decisions is that I think for us, it might feel sort of simplest and easiest just to say, I don't want to be involved. Ask him. But in fact, he's explained to us the reasons why maybe he we shouldn't deflect, why we might actually consider deceiving. And the question is, are those reasons good enough to participate in the deception, which, you know, you, you won't like me. I don't have like strong um, answers, yes or no, to all these cases. <laughs> um, but I do, I do sort of think that the fact that this is a capacitated patient who is requesting this, also an important feature of this framework that I didn't have time to look at is um, situations where we are asked information that is actually confidential and protected by HIPAA. So we need to be HIPAA compliant with the information that we give. That takes you off the framework altogether as well. Like we just are not allowed to answer. So it, it, that would be sort of a legally sanctioned act of deflection. Right. So that actually, that's a good example of that. If, you know, if the wife is asking informa for information that might be um, confidential or HIPAA protected, then we we probably should not um, answer that question. So would that be considered one of those instances? Of um, deflection? You no, know, of like HIPAA compliance to the patient to like to the wife. Compliance to the, oh, yeah. So that, that, um, Lying to, so the point here is yes, that we might have good reason to lie to the wife in this scenario. Yeah, because we are sort of protecting an interest that has been articulated by the capacitated patient. Yeah, very good, yes. Uh, so I want to get an opinion uh, from you. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Farewell uh, on Netflix. I don't think I have. Famous uh, Aquafina is in it, and oh. it's a cultural aspect of uh, autonomy and yeah. information. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering whether you think this could be part of one of your added axes. Mm -hmm. or if you think this is too relative yeah. to think about culture. culture. Yeah. Yeah. So I, if I, I haven't seen the movie, but I think I know the premise, the idea that in certain cultures, we just, we do not tell um, bad diagnoses to the patient. This is sort of a family matter. Decision-making happens at the family level. We don't bother the patient with it. And that is sort of a cultural commitment that might sanction deception, like sort of widespread deception, actually. So I think this is um, a fantastic question and a very good case where like, gosh, we, we do want to be culturally sensitive. Like we don't want to impose information that is unwanted on patients. This might be though a good example of preventive work where if we suspect that this might be a sort of cultural commitment of a family, ask way ahead of time before there's any bad news to get, you know, anything that would, you know, we need to potentially deceive about and say, you know, and um, I, we've, uh, worked with families in the past that have said, you know what, I, the patient, I don't want to know um, the all the details of the information. And in fact, I really do prefer that you talk to my loved ones, my husband, my children about that. Um, and that actually, I think, gives us a really strong reason. That actually shows us very clearly, this is a way to respect the autonomy of the patient to withhold this, this information. The premise in the, story, in the, in the movie though, yeah. is not the patient, right? The patient, it, it's the family who's making the decision. Right, right. The weird thing is that, well, nevertheless, we'll ask the patient. Well, I think that's maybe the best. So the, the risk is that we're presuming the commitments of an individual patient based on the values of the family or the culture. And while, in fact, those might align quite well in many cases, it's a little dangerous to presume that they always align, that, the we're, that we're always respecting exactly what the patient would want in these cases, which is why I kind of tend to prefer a more preventive approach when it's available to us. But I think once it's once we're sort of, you know, facing the bad news and the family member that's saying, absolutely, do not tell my mom, this is a matter for me and my brothers and sisters to attend to, then we sort of need to get, we need to maybe ask some follow-up questions about that would help us understand better the patient's commitment to those same values, right? Um, but I think that that's a very good example of a way of a, an act of deception that we are maybe, uh, you know, perhaps more commonly presented with that feels like different, like we want to respect the cultural commitments of our patients and families. And, and this might be a way to do that, even though it conflicts with, you know, a strongly held belief. Um, 
perhaps we'll do a, a Zoom or a, a virtual question. Yeah, yeah, we have a question from uh, the computer. <clears throat> what about when patients disclose information to one clinician that they don't want shared with the rest of the team? How should clinician weigh the responsibility of keeping or sharing that information? Excellent question. Uh, one that Abe and I actually specifically said, like, we need to follow up with this paper and look at deception, not just to patients and families, because that was the focus of the paper, but to other healthcare personnel, to insurance companies, to institutions. Like, there are all sorts of other actors, organizations, and people that we might consider deceiving. Um, and this is, a, I think, a really good example of that. Um, I don't know that I have any like fabulous guidance for that uh, sort of scenario, but I think some of the things on the framework still might help you better understand what your obligations might be in terms of coordination and visibility, um, the nature of the information, the type of act that you're considering. Um, another, you know, um, hasn't been brought up yet, but I'll just sort of volunteer it as an issue with these sorts of acts of deception is documentation. We want to keep really clear and accurate records of what's happening, what conversations we're having, what's happening with our patients. But what happens when we do actually choose to deceive about something and we want to sort of document that in an accurate way, but also there's legal liability with that. Like it opens up a whole other can of worms that I think, you know, you'd need some really good, um, perhaps an ethics consultation to help you, you know, wade through some of these issues um, to think through what our documentation obligations might be. You know, they say, tell the truth, you said, do no harm. Do no harm, yeah. Right. I mean, and that's exactly the point, which is in some cases, by not telling the truth, we are helping people, right? We are avoiding harm. Um, the, the question is, which cases are which, right? In which cases do we really owe the patient or family truth? And in which cases are we helping the patient in a really significant or important um, and doing no harm with our with our actions or words? Yeah. Yes. I was wondering, I don't know if this is covered in some part of the framework. Do you think it's worse if the act of deception would be likely to reoccur perhaps more than once? I feel like in the case of like the transfusion, that mm -hmm. lie would have come back once. There might be cases where you can pursue that silence. Over and over, yes. So I think we intended that to be captured on the coordination axis, like not just coordination across people, but kind of coordination across time. Um, but I think it is a very important question to ask, maybe perhaps specifically, like how many times would I need to lie or withhold about this particular event? And perhaps the more times would require stronger justification. 